Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth in our series of What Matters with the Southern California Water Coalition. I'm Charlie Wilson. I get to serve as the executive director, and I am really excited about today's conversation. Uh, and I know from the numbers of folks who have asked and signed up to participate in today, this is a very popular uh, topic and a popular guest that we have. Uh, but before we formally get started, uh, I do want to just share our, our uh, just some a little bit of logistics for you today, as we have done in the past. We are recording, uh, so this will be available after we conclude today's conversation. We will uh, run through, make sure we had no errors, and we will post this to the Southern California Water Coalition website. So if you want to repeat it, you want to share it, you want to uh, repurpose it, we encourage you to please do so. Uh, as we have also done, because we have a number of folks that are with us on today's uh, program, we have all of the guests uh, on mute, uh, and we will not open those mics. So if you have questions, which we highly encourage your questions today in the conversation, please use the chat box in the Zoom. Uh, we are monitoring that, and I will be batching those questions, and we'll include those uh, when we get through with Tim's formal presentation and then engage in the conversation. Uh, as we also do, and we've not had any issue with this, and we again thank you for that as well. Uh, try to keep things civil today. Sometimes these water issues get a little heated, get a little con uh, contested, uh, but I think today is part of our overall program to educate and bring you information so that stakeholders and elected officials, policymakers can make informed choice. I think you'll be very pleased with the kind of program and, and the exchange of views that we have today. I also want to make sure that I highlight and say thank you because without their assistance, we couldn't do this financially. Today's webinar sponsor is the Cayegas Municipal Water District. So we thank very much the folks at Cayegas. We also like to thank our founding sponsors, the Inland Empire Utility Agency, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Irvine Ranch Water District, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, Los Angeles County Public Works, Riverside County Flood Control, West Basin Municipal Water District, and our newest sponsor to this list, the San Bernardino County. So with that, I wanna say thank you to those sponsors. And again, thank you to all of you who have joined us. Uh, we have set record crowds for today's participation. And I think as I introduce our guests, you'll see why. But today we're gonna to hear from Tim Quinn. And Tim Quinn is a well-known commodity within the water business in California. But formerly Tim served as the executive director of the Association of California Water Agencies for a whole bunch of years. And before that, he got his training, his training wheels. Is that it, Tim? Your training <laughs> wheels was at the Metropolitan Water District, Southern California. Uh, Tim is now affiliated with Stanford, uh, the Stanford University and Stanford Law School, and has recently uh, written a very intriguing white paper on the issue of collaboration and how to really get through, work through, and resolve some of California's more vexing problems, that being the issue of water policy. So we are very pleased to welcome Tim <coughs> Quinn to today's program. Tim, I'm gonna turn it over to you. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Charlie. Lynn, you gonna put up the uh, PowerPoint? I wanna thank everybody yeah. for the opportunity to be here today. The, I, I'm told there were like 220 people registered for this event, which kind of blew me out of my chair here in my home office. Uh, you know, when you retire, one of the things that you miss the most is the people. And I want you all to know I miss you, but not enough to unretire. Um, uh, this presentation today started with a conversation between Charlie and myself. And I want to thank Charlie for this opportunity. And I want to thank Charlie for his leadership. He has really taken the Southern California Water Coalition in a powerful uh, new direction. You guys are something of a juggernaut. <clears throat> today gives me the ability to answer the question, which I know has been on all your minds. So what has Tim Quinn been doing uh, since he retired from Aqua? Well, the answer is my life revolves around what Ann Hayden, my friend at EDF, calls the three Gs. The first G is for grandkids and uh, family. The second G is for golf. I'm still not very good, but I'm getting better. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the third G is for governance. Uh, I've developed something of a passion as I look back on my career uh, for governance and the importance of getting it right. So I'm here today to talk to you about that. But before we get started, uh, I need to give you a spoiler alert. Uh, you know, that is much of what I'm about to talk about comes from boots on the ground experience over a 40 year career in California water. So uh, this presentation is to a significant degree autobiographical. I would date the beginning of my um, 
uh, water career to, to 1978, 42 years ago. I had just come back from serving on the White House staff in Washington, D.C., uh, and decided to write my PhD dissertation in economics at UCLA on groundwater management. At the same time, I was working at the Rand Corporation, rubbing el elbows with some truly extraordinary uh, water economists at Rand. In 1985, my phone rang. It was the Metropolitan Water District, and I started a 22-year stint uh, at MWD. Uh, uh, hashtag Lynn. There we go. Uh, d d and uh, in 2007, I, as all of you know, I went to Aqua uh, as its executive director where, like my years at MWD, I had some really great opportunities to influence uh, California water policy and changes therein. When I retired at the end of 2018, I was, I was notified by Stanford that they wanted me to be a fellow there, which frankly shocked me. It could have knocked me over with a feather, but I had this great opportunity to be reflective about what my 40-year career meant. Uh, and at Stanford, I combined that experience with things I was learning from my colleagues at Stanford and from students at Stanford, and from uh, especially political scientists that I got to know all around uh, the, the country. Today, I'm going to summarize uh, uh, one of the products of that fellowship. It's this report, which I will refer to as the 40 years report. Um, so you might be thinking, what did Tim learn when he was at Stanford? The answer is, at a 100,000 foot level of elevation, I learned that governance is the most important decision you, we make in advancing new policies or projects, especially when they're complicated and controversial, but we don't think about government, governance as much as we should. Another valuable lesson, uh, general lesson from that 40 year career is that collaboration works and conflict doesn't. I learned this by reaching across si silo boundaries hundreds of times during my career. It turns out that that's Carl Blanke top left with Lois Krieger, uh, the first woman president of Aqua and the first uh, chair of the Metropolitan Water District. This picture was taken in the early 1990s. Carl wanted a coalition builder. We didn't talk about it that way, but, uh, but late, much later when, after he retired, we talked about the role that I had fulfilled for him and I was doing just pretty much what he wanted. One of the first things was I helped Carl build a North-South urban coalition, which had never existed before and which changed the pattern of California water, I believe. Uh, the, the fellow there is Andy Moran. Many of you know Andy. Uh, he was one of our partners back then, and he is still a commissioner at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. I spent probably more time with agriculture than any other sector in California water. Uh, there on the left, we have my dear friend, Tom, uh, Clark and, and Dan Nelson. That's Howard Frick, the president of the Urban Edison Water Storage District. They were all extraordinary water leaders from the San Joaquin Valley. In the Sacramento Valley, I got to know people like Mary Wells, uh, Brent Hasty, who was the president of Aqua when I, when I retired. And that gentleman there, he's gone now. But in the mid, in the mid 1990s, Gary Brown, was, who was the general manager of the Western Canal Water District, was truly a delight to work with. Baranke even sent his young economist up to the Bay Area to get to know and to work with environmentalists up there. Uh, that's Mark Reisner of uh, Cadillac Desert fame. He became a good friend and colleague, as did Tom Graff and John Krautkramer of the Environmental Defense Fund. All three of those gentlemen are gone now, but there's a new generation of water leaders. That I've got Ann Hayden at EDF uh, uh, symbolizing them. And if you don't know these, this new generation of environmentalists, uh, it's time to get to uh, it's time to get to know them. Um, so um, I want to spend the I have so far I hit you with two bold assertions. The first one is that uh, governance is really important, maybe the most important decision you make when you're trying to do something big and controversial. And the second one is that collaboration is the best form of governance. Well, I want to spend the rest of this presentation convincing you that those aren't mere assertions. They are, in fact, very logical conclusions. So let's start at the, at the, with the basics, uh, with the question, what is governance? Now, my answer to you is going to come from a, a book that I recommend you look at, uh, written by Adela Schlager and Bill Bloomquist. Bill, in particular, has become a valued colleague. Uh, they wrote a book in 2008. Uh, called Embracing Watershed Politics. Think about that title for a, a minute, and it's definitely recommended reading on the Tim Quinn recommended list. Uh, Schlager and Bloomquist argued that any public policy has to answer three basic questions. The first one is who gets what and when? The second one is who decides? And the third one is how are these decisions made? 
governance is the umbrella over how those three questions are approached in any particular public policy arena. Now, importantly, in California water policy, we have answered those important basic questions in very different ways over time. Uh, Schlager and Blumquist also suggest that there are three eras of uh, decision making for natural resources and watersheds. The first is the development era. By the way, I think this three um, I think that this three era model fits California water exceptionally well. The first era is the development era. For us, this ran starting in the early 20th century uh, with the LA DWP and the, and the Los Angeles Aqueducts. And it ran through roughly the early to mid 1980s. Um, the, the development era focuses almost entirely on economic growth and the infrastructure that is necessary uh, for a growing economy. Uh, the environment doesn't count for much during the development era. And the negative environmental consequences were substantial uh, and widespread, uh, which gave rise to the environmental movement. And we entered into the second uh, de decision-making era, the regulatory era, uh, to unwind the environmental consequences of the development era and to make sure that future economic development was more environmentally sound. Uh, the regulatory era for California water started in the early 1970s. And I would argue that it still lingers today. Uh, the final era, the collaborative era, is I think a logical evolution from the first two eras of decision making for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Uh, in the collaboration era, uh, we've, been ex we, we've been experimenting with collaboration since the 1980s, certainly my, over my entire career, but I would strongly argue we have not entered a truly collaborative era of decision making just yet. Uh, one, one other thing, because I get a lot of questions about this, note that the, the eras don't line up sequentially. Uh, one era does not politely step aside and let the other era proceed. At any point in time, you can see decision making from each of these eras in California water. Uh, I think that will be less true when we get into a full uh, collaborative era, but, but today we're still trying to decide if we want to get there or not. Just as there are three eras of decision making, uh, there are three types of decision making processes. Now, I'm taking this information from two UC Berkeley uh, political scientists, Chris Ansel and Allison Gash, Gash, who is now at the University of Oregon, they wrote an article that really caught my attention. It was uh, published in 2007. Uh, uh, the, the, for, according to Ansel and Gash, the first type of decision making is managerialism. And they define that as public agencies are going through relatively closed processes and unilaterally making decisions based on what their in-house agency experts think. The public may be involved in a, in a uh, managerial uh, decision-making process, but they're, they're only commenters. They are not decision-makers in any way, shape, or form. The second form of decision-making is adversarialism. We all know that one. That's where adversaries face off with each other, go to battle in a winner-take-all process. This is a courtroom where a lot of that happens, but, it, but, but adversarial clashes can happen in legislative arenas or in uh, regulatory arenas as well. Uh, finally, the third type of decision-making is collaboration. Uh, collaboration involves public agencies and stakeholders shaping policy jointly through an open and transparent process. In contrast to managerialism, uh, which often leads to conflict because uh, the decision maker doesn't have to get people to agree with them, stakeholders are an integral part of a collaborative decision making process. They are not merely commenters. Uh, so moving on, this is how the three errors and the three decision making processes uh, match up with each other. In the development era, again, the policy goals are almost purely economic. Uh, and the decision-making process is very centralized and managerial. Think about Mulholland, O'Shaughnessy, Harvey Banks, and a lot of other icons who built our infrastructure back in the 20th century. Uh, those projects faced fierce opposition in some cases, but the, this, but the governmental decision-making process did not allow the critics to, to influence policy. Uh, when we got into the regulatory era, the, the policy objectives, of course, shifted from economic development to environmental protection and where you could restoration. Uh, but I find it really interesting when I got to thinking about this at Stanford, uh, the decision-making process did not change. In the regulatory era, just as in the development era, uh, the decision-making process was highly centralized and managerial uh, and, and oftentimes adversarial. It was, uh, the, the only difference was it wasn't driven by water agencies, it was driven by regulatory agencies. In the collaborative era, uh, things are going to get more complex when, in terms of the types of policies that you pursue. Uh, 
Uh, the collaborative era will almost always have multiple policy objectives, not a single policy objectives. The economy and the environment count equally. All the, the stakeholder sectors, ag, urban environment, they all uh, will play a role and have to be dealt with. And I believe that will require a collaborative, decentralized, inclusive governance model. And we need to start thinking about uh, how we want to go about doing that. Now, in this table, no matter which cell you're talking about, no matter what era or what kind of decision-making process you're going through, water policy is always being made in a political environment. Um, so uh, the, the, this next slide, I like to show this slide to students who have a strong aversion uh, to politics. They think politics is something to be avoided, and I'm trying to convince them they shouldn't. You've got to think about that black box of politics, because in the political world, you have lots of stakeholders who hire lobbyists, uh, those lobbyists seem to be climbing all over our democratic institutions. You even have to feel, deal with people like this. That's David Bernhardt and his boss, Donald Trump, because they will influ influence the policymaking environment. Uh, the fact is our policymaking process is very, very participative. In, a, in a, any controversial and complicated policy area like health work, that health, that's the top left, or my good friend, Mar uh, 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 Mario Santoya, who, that's a public uh, water rally at the Capitol not too many years ago. Uh, in any public policy arena, you have scores, even hundreds, of decentralized entities and interest groups that are working the legislative or administrative process to try and influence policy outcomes. Uh, that's, by the way, the California Assembly, uh, Water Parks and Life, uh, Wildlife Committee, uh, meeting and listening to those interest, interest groups. So in making or understanding water policy, you must deal with the reality you can't escape politics. In a democracy like ours, public policy is, is forged through a political process. Uh, here I'm quoting uh, Schlager and Bloomquist 2008 uh, directly, for people to govern watersheds well requires that they make collective choices. Collective choices are ultimately political choices, thus governing watersheds well requires embracing politics. I actually re re realize this at a very young age. I, I knew when I was writing my PhD dissertation that I couldn't ignore the political environment in which water, uh, in which water policy was being made. And at the time, as an economist, uh, it seemed natural to think about political decision-making in terms of market dynamics. After all, private markets are places where decentralized entities compete to provide goods and services. Uh, in political markets, decentralized entities compete to influence policy decisions. In private markets, at least in classical economic theory, decisions are made by decentralized entities guided by Adam Smith's famous invisible hand to determine the price, supply, and demand for goods and services. In political markets, uh, decisions are made by centralized public entities with considerable stakeholder participation. Political markets determine the rules of the game, uh, which we all know is really important. To influence decisions, stakeholders compete oftentimes by building coalitions. How many of you have worked to put together that letter with over 100 logos or signatures to advance a common policy po uh, position in a regulatory agency or a legislature? Almost all of you have in one way or another participated in, in that kind of process. Now, an interesting difference between private markets and, and, and political markets, in private markets, collaboration is viewed as bad. They call it, economists call it collusion, and it's bad because it introduces inefficiency and reduces aggregate uh, wealth. In political, mar in political markets, collaboration within and amongst uh, interest groups is essential in the political marketplace to, to securing sound policy outcomes. Coalition building, and certainly based on my experience, coalition building is the essence of political competition. In the political marketplace, elected officials and regulators are obviously important. They, they make the decisions in the end, but they are working in a sea of stakeholders who build coalitions to try and influence public policy decisions. By the way, I found the picture bottom right uh, on the internet. It was labeled, quote, angry man at public meeting, end quote. So I gra grabbed it up. We'll be seeing angry man again. Uh, moving on, it shifts in demand and supply. They drive uh, private markets. Uh, but it's shifts in coalitions that will drive outcomes in political markets. Coalition building is the, is, uh, there we go, thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, coalition building is universal in the political marketplace. I participated in hundreds of 
political and policy processes over the course of my career. And we were always focused on building a coalition to support a common policy goal. But at Stanford, I came to realize that not all coalitions are alike. Uh, in particular, warrior coalitions are driven to grow their silos, make it as big and powerful as possible um, uh, so that you can defeat the other uh, silos in the, in the political battle. Warriors tend to participate in all or nothing uh, uh, decision-making processes. Uh, it's, it, it, and their goal, like, like Cassius Clay uh, in 1964, soon to be Muhammad Ali, is to put your opponent, in this case, Sonny Liston, on the mat. Uh, in collaborative coalitions, stakeholders work to knock down those silo walls, get people to venture out of their silos and work uh, together uh, 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 across silo band boundaries, uh, and you're not trying to put your, your other interest groups on the mat, you're trying to work together to climb to the top of the policy mountain. Okay, I confess these images are not exactly neutral. The warrior image is pretty harsh, although who doesn't like and admire uh, Muhammad Ali? The collaboration image is soft, it's got orange colors like a sunset, uh, it's very inviting. All this tells you uh, that the speaker has a strong preference for collaborative coalition building. And I do, that's true. Uh, but I make this choice, I got to tell you, with my eyes wide open, the fact is I know as much as anybody that uh, co collaboration is really hard work. Uh, first, because you are venturing outside the safety of your silo and getting others to do so. You do this to forge compromises. They almost always irritate greatly uh, the hardliners who can be found in every one of the uh, silos. You reach compromise through a decentralized, inclusive, open, and transparent process, which usually requires a big tent, bigger than the more powerful eight stakeholders usually are comfortable with. When I showed this tent image to my students at uh, Stanford, one of them said, asked, isn't that a circus tent? And my response was yes. And if you're engaged in a collaborative process, you will sometimes feel like you were in a circus. It is, after all, where you're dealing with angry man. Um, Collaboration also means considering multiple goals simultaneously. Unlike the regulatory era, unlike the, uh, uh, the de development era, uh, you don't think about just one thing and then maximize, maximize that and, 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 and then deal the residual to other interests. All the interests have to be dealt with simultaneously. Um, you, you, a, a successful collaboration has to work for the economy and the environment, and it has to work for all interest sectors that are engaged in it, which is complicated. And for all of the, the to accomplish this almost always requires, I'll get there in a second, uh, a more complex policy loose set than was true in earlier eras. And that's why I've always told my staff at, at MWD and at uh, ACWA that coalition, uh, war is easy, collaboration is hell. And anybody listening to this that worked for Tim Quinn will be smiling now, they will rem remember that. Uh, it, 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 I just wanna underscore that doing collaboration is, is hard work, but it's also the only way to solve some of these wicked problems that we face in California, uh, California water. So if you've gone through the hell of a successful collaboration, how do you make the new policy stand up and not be victim to the entropy that often afflicts the political marketplace? Well, in market terms, that question comes down to uh, how do you assure a stable policy equilibrium? How can we be sure that Lady Justice's scales here in this picture are uh, viewed as fair and balanced by a wide range of interest groups that are out there? Uh, well, to start with, you need an equilibrium in both the private and the political market. In the private market, equilibriums are pretty straightforward. Demand equals supply, this is from microeconomics. Demand equals supply, all firms are making a normal profit so that resources don't wanna go one place or another. Uh, in the political market, I think that equilibriums are, are trickier and more complicated. In the, in the political market, equilibrium is, a, is, is driven by coalition dynamics. If you have taken the time and trouble, and it takes a lot of time and trouble, to build a broad-based coalition that supports a new, important, controversial policy, that policy will be more likely to be sound and to be durable. A, a policy that has not made that investment in coalition building with, with splintered stakeholders and warriors determined to bring the policy down uh, will be unstable and may well be undone. The bottom line, a sound, durable policy is all about building a broad base support coalition. Now, I know I've made, I certainly think collaboration is really important. I think it's really hard, but despite all those challenges, 
I would like to talk to you about uh, a string of successful collaborations in California uh, that, uh, uh, that I've been a part of and some that I haven't been a part of. Uh, these are, uh, the, 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 many of these examples are summarized in the 40 years report that I'm talking about. Those that aren't, they all have websites. Uh, one of the first collaborations I was extensively involved with was in the late 80s and early 90s, the, uh, the Urban Conservation Best Management Practices Agreement. That's Doug Wheeler, who was the Resources Secretary, looks a lot younger. I uh, still uh, interact with Doug once in a while. Um, and it, where this came from, urban agencies understood in the 1980s that conservation recycling, they knew that that stuff was going to be important for reliability. And those of us uh, managers at Metropolitan Rails were, were trying to turn conservation into a positive so that local boards of directors would support it. And then we got hit with a, uh, a state uh, from the state board, uh, Delta, I think it was a Delta a water quality control plan that relied almost exclusively on one size fits all regulation of urban conservation. The urban community went up and uh, went up in protest and we convinced to their credit, uh, the state board staff that we should work on a collaborative process that resulted in the BMPs. Uh, it, it, that agreement was essentially signed by 354 entities, including almost 200 uh, uh, urban public water supply agencies and nearly 40 uh, environmental NGO. It didn't last forever, but it set the stage for conservation for 20 years. About the same time, the 1987 to 92 drought uh, was raging. Uh, talk about something that threatened to get the warriors out uh, battling each other, but we did a collaborative process. We developed the uh, the 1991 drought water bank, there were a couple of other drought water banks in the 90s, but a really rather remarkable showing how the, the marketplace could work to, to, to deal with the challenges of the drought. To me, more importantly, it replaced potential serious adversarialism with a collaborative approach uh, through the drought water bank. Uh, later in 1994, chaos was uh, in the Delta was averted. Okay, at, at, at least it was a lesson with the Bay Delta Accord, which is, in my view, probably the high point of collaboration over the last few decades. The Accord stabilized the Delta for a decade, uh, although entropy eventually took over. And this photo, which I'm gonna return to, uh, that, that picture was taken in December 15th, 1994. It's Governor Pete Wilson and Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt celebrating the Bay Delta Accord. Two weeks earlier, uh, the state water contractors and DWR at a, at a uh, at a conference, at an Aqua Fall conference in Monterey, announced uh, uh, they had reached agreement on what became known as the Monterey Agreement. While that agreement was the subject of, of considerable controversy and extended litigation by uh, some environmentalists, Monterey was a clear victory of collaboration over ad adversarialism, and it introduced the state water contractors to the, in the ability to modernize uh, their water supply portfolios and, and deal with a new age. Uh, moving to the 21st century, we have had major collaborative, collaborative success stories forging truly historic legislation, including the 2009 Reform Act, the 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and Proposition 1 passed by a two to one margin, giving us $7.5 billion to invest in the water supply system of, of, Cal of California. Um, collaborative success stories have not just been happening in statewide policy, they've been happening uh, more than you can count at the local level. These are four examples of locals that took charge uh, to do environmental, usually fishery restoration in ways that were consistent with healthy and stable water supplies for the communities that they served. I was very privileged, the top three here uh, are all from the Sacramento Valley and some of the most rewarding experiences of my career were playing a role on Butte Creek, on the Yuba River, on Battle Creek, true success stories for collaboration for the fish and for the farmers up in those regions. Uh, in, a, in a nod to the Colorado River, the one at the bottom symbolizes the Lower Colorado River Multi-Species Conservation Plan, uh, which is a link, uh, which is a vital link in modern management of the Lower Colorado River. Um, there are more success stories for collaboration at, in water manage, local water management than I can mention here, but I wanna talk about three uh, in particular. The first two boxes uh, symbolize, picture of symbolize Agricultural and Urban Integrated Water Resources Management Plans, or IRPs. Uh, the, obviously, the, that, the work which has happened all over California, it diversified water supply portfolios, but it was also a fundamental revolutionary change in governance, uh, where governance became more collaborative so you could get more parties working together towards a common goal of responsible water supply reliability. One of my favorite examples of collaboration shown on the right, that's the 
Freeport intake uh, for East, which, which served East Baymont and South Sacramento County. Uh, I, I know that some of you were probably following this just like I was, uh, but the, for over 20 years, East Bay Mud uh, uh, was engaged in an adversarial process trying to unsuccessfully to throw its weight around uh, and get a diversion on the American River at Lake Natomas. They were opposed by Sacramento County. They were opposed by fishery champions on the American River. And, and, and amazingly, East Bay Mud decided to switch gears. They stopped working through an adversarial process, switched to a collaborative model, uh, and, and within a couple of years, uh, within a few years, they built their second peripheral canal with an intake downstream on the Sacramento River to the benefit of their ratepayers, to the benefit of South Sacramento County water users, and for the American River fisheries. Now, for a Southern California audience like I've got today, this may irritate you. After all, they have two peripheral canals and you don't have one. Uh, but what I want you to think about is how they got through collaboration. Um, uh, next, uh, the last set of examples, I just want to give you very quickly a few examples of uh, true watershed scale. These are big picture collaborations uh, to demonstrate that, that you can do collaboration even in highly complex uh, watershed environments. The two on the top uh, are the San Gabriel Valley, uh, San Gabriel uh, uh, River Basin and the Santa Ana River Basin. And many of you listening to me probably know more about what's going on in these basins than I do. But they were both examples of something that started with adversarial decision making in the courts and eventually gave way very successfully to collaborative decision making that is working at a watershed scale. On the bottom are two examples outside of California. Uh, the one on the bottom left is the uh, uh, Yakima River Basin. I put it up here. I'm going to do one of these presentations tomorrow for the Sacramento Valley folks, and they are very interested in the uh, what, what has gone on up in the Yakima River Water Basin, where they have a multiple benefit resources management plan. Uh, uh, that I've looked it over, and it looks pretty sound to me, and it's something that they're looking to replicate, uh, perhaps in some ways, up in the Sacramento Valley. Now, the the last example, maybe I'm just interested in the Platte River Basin because that's where I was born. Uh, uh, you know, in the western Nebraska part of this map and spent my first 13 years, but they really have done some remarkable things with collaboration in the Platte River, uh, in the Platte River Basin. Not unlike our Bay Delta, it started with ESA action. Back in the 90s, uh, the whooping crane and five other species were uh, uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act. They get a whooping crane, we get a delta smelt. I don't know if that's fair or not, but that's the way it is. Uh, uh, but what they did in the Platte River Basin, they used collaboration to solve these problems, and they're well down the road, unlike California, where we are still suing each other in the courts uh, 30 years later. So I hope that I've convinced you that collaboration is important, uh, but that it's also very hard. Uh, and all of these examples, I, th I think, are informative, uh, and, and they've all been successful to one degree or another. I'd like to turn to what are the factors of success? Why, why, why have these things have these initiatives been largely successful. At the top of the list of factors of success is leadership. Uh, and this is re really an important point. Uh, it is not the top-down managerial leadership of Mulholland, O'Shaughnessy, Harvey Banks, and the others that built our infrastructure in the 20th century. Collaboration requires what Ansel and Gash call facilitative leadership. If you think of leadership as we're going to construct tunnels under the Delta and you're going to live with it, whether you like it or not, well, good luck with that strategy to you. Uh, collaborative leaders lead from the bottom up, which is not an easy thing to do. I learned that in Aqua. Um, uh, but, but to lead you, gain value and knowledge from the diverse participants in the process that can't lead a collaborative by deciding up front all the details that you want and trying to get others to agree with you. Uh, leadership comes from, in the examples I've cited, comes from many, many different places. Uh, at the top picture there, there's a woman named Betsy Riki that I'm sure some of you had the pleasure to meet. She was, I think, undeniably the best collaborative leader I ever worked with in my career. But leadership happens at the local level as well. Uh, the bottom pictures are people engaged with the Western Canal Water District. It's on the Feather River, real near Oroville, not too far south of Chico River. Uh, one picture is the current board of directors of the Western Canal Water District. And then there's Ted Trimble, uh, who's the manager today, and Gary, it says Nelson, it should say Brown, sorry. Um, the, uh, uh, who, who, who I worked with back in the 90s. I put these guys up because they were the ones, they were the spark that led to uh, the Butte Creek Restoration Project, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a great example of how collaboration can work effectively. Now, I can tell you for certain, Betsy Rieke did not know 
at the beginning of, what, of the Bay Delta Accord process that it was going to produce an agreement with four categories of, of, of agreement. She didn't know that. She let the process work. Western Canal didn't know that they were going to wind up retrofitting most of their uh, distribution system. In particular, they took out the largest dam in their service area and replaced it with the $10 million siphon. That was something they learned about in the process. These were leaders that did, that did not dictate up front. They trusted a co collaborative process, protected it, and let it make decisions. The second success factor I want to talk about is stakeholder uh, in, engaging the stakeholders. And this can be really difficult because uh, you all know that for some stakeholders, the pull of the winner take all BATNA going to court and, and winning by God, that can be pretty, pretty strong and it makes it difficult to keep people at the table. Uh, uh, but uh, it, there, there's always conflict between warriors and collaborationists. And if you want a successful collaboration, you have to be w w watching for that and have strategies for dealing with it. Uh, this photo was, I mentioned earlier, taken in December 15th, 1994, as Governor Wilson and Interior Sec Secretary Babbitt celebrated the Bay Delta Accord. I was in that room standing right next to the aqua uh, photographer. Uh, so I had just exactly this angle on what was going on. Uh, by the way, the photographer was Jennifer Persaik, whom many of you know. Of course, the stage is filled with, uh, with state and federal official. But what I want to draw your attention to are the stakeholders on that stage, starting on the left. John Krautkramer, Environmental Defense Fund. Dan Nelson, San Luis Delta Mendota Water Authority. Dave Schuster, State Water Contractors. Steve Hall, Aqua. Bonnie Herman, who represented Southern California business interests, Gary Bobker, the Bay Institute, and my boss at the time, Woody Woodraska, uh, Metropolitan Water District. The accord held together these stakeholder groups for at least a while. Uh, we need to figure out how to do it on a longer term basis. Uh, there were, at, in, in 1994, there were warrior critics of the, of the accord in all three camps, but the agreement had a broad enough base of support to hold up for uh, over a decade. So my message to you in Southern California or Northern California, if you want a collaborative success, be prepared to make the compromises that are necessary to fill up that stage when you announce uh, a successful negotiation. Um, last, the, the next uh, uh, key success factor, institutional design. This one's really important and it's really hard, uh, uh, but you have to decide who's in the tent, who's not in the tent. Uh, I tend to think more inclusiveness is better. Uh, and, but how are decisions going to be made by the group? What's, your, what's your, your rules for voting? Do you have just one tent? Do you have more than one tent? Uh, with, with a big tent with little tents underneath it. Uh, how are you going to make decisions? Unanimity, unanimity is always a worthy goal, but rarely achievable. And you rarely see uh, successful collaboratives that have uh, unanimous consent required for decision making. Uh, typically, they have some sort of supermajority. And there are all sorts of clever ways to approach this, where on the one hand, you can make decisions uh, but on the other hand, uh, no interest group feels like it's been left out. Um, most collaboratives wind up with big tents. Uh, they, they, they get used to it. They're going to be bigger than some of you would like them to be. Uh, in terms of who's in the tent, it's really important to look, up, look beyond just the project or policy proponents. Who's going to be affected by that policy, uh, positive or negative, and who might want to take it to court or otherwise get in your way? Uh, you know, think about some environmental NGOs. Uh, you, you, when you're thinking about who's in the tent, give those thoughts some consideration. And it's absolutely imperative that the decision-making process be fully open, transparent, and inclusive. And not just lip service. You see a lip service a lot with, with these things. It's got to be truly open, transparent, and inclusive. Uh, be prepared to confront angry man. Here he is back again, uh, uh, early and, and, and with empathy, uh, uh, because you're going to have to deal with a fair amount of conflict inside that big tent. And finally, one, just a brief word on entrepreneurship. One huge difference between adversarialism and collaboration is collaboration opened up a wide range of opportunities for what I'll call entrepreneurs, people to be creative about how you work around conflict and how uh, you can move a, a complicated group towards, uh, towards consensus. Okay, the last factor of success I'm going to talk about is crisis. Uh, many, I think, I think most of the super majority of the examples I gave you uh, many of them were triggered by crisis, drought, proposed harsh regulation, threatened, reg uh, threatened litigation, the fear of a winner-take-all process often results in collaboration. To me, that's the best thing about adversarialism. You can use it to trigger as a crisis uh, to, to trigger a collaboration. Well, one region that seems to always be in crisis in California is, guess where? The Delta. Despite crisis after crisis, with the brief exception of the Bay Delta Accord, 
we have yet to resort to true collaboration in the Delta in a meaningful and durable way. I don't have to convince anybody watching this, uh, the, 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 this uh, Zoom cast that the Delta is important. It's the hub of the system. It's important to the environment. It's important to urban and agricultural uh, water users and economies. Uh, and because it's so important, every governor for the last 40 plus years has had to think about the Delta. Um, can you, Lynn, can you advance the slide for me? Thank you. Um, there was, of course, young Jerry Brown with the Peripheral Canal, uh, followed by George Duke Mason, Duke's Ditch, followed by Pete Wilson with, with some success with the Bay Delta Accord. Gray Davis uh, uh, signed the record of decision for Cal Fed, which was better than he got credit for. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger jumped on the Bay Delta Conservation uh, Plan bandwagon. BDCP was also supported uh, by Governor Brown, but he had to pull the plug on it because the regulators wouldn't agree uh, to, to long-term assurances. Uh, but, but of course, the first thing that Gavin Newsom did uh, when he became governor was pull the plug on what, what, had, what had been called water fits by that point in time. Uh, and we're starting all over with the water resiliency portfolio. All I can say is that we should have a collective G's right now. Um, the, uh, uh, if you ask the question, why did, uh, uh, Lynn, hashtag, there we go. Uh, if, if all these bipartisan governors supported action in the Delta, why is it still such a mess? I think the answer is because we got the governance wrong. The Delta is where the warriors clash in California water. Uh, it, it, it has been the subject in this century, at least, of, of managerial and adversarial decision-making process, both at the state level and at the local level. Uh, there's been um, uh, the, uh, the water users seem to want to go back to the development era in a lot of cases. The environmentalists definitely want to go back to the regulatory era where they think they, they had more power, but they can't solve their problems in that era that gave them power. Most important in the 21st century, we have not invested in a coalition building strategy around any Delta action plan. Uh, Governor Brown certainly didn't have a broad-based coalition to support the water fix, and I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, Governor Newsom pulled its plug. Uh, we have not even tried in this century to fill up that stage. Bottom line, we fail in the Delta because we are using decision-making processes from earlier eras when only collaboration will work in a 21st century collaborative era. If you ask me what's the current status of collaboration in California, I'm going to start by saying I'm encouraged by recent news reports that Wade uh, Crowfoot, the Resources Secretary, is out there trying to revitalize the, uh, uh, the voluntary agreements and get us out of court. That's important, but I still got plenty of worries. At the top, uh, our state and federal leaders, let's just put it politely, they do not see the world the same way. And that, their relationship and the relationship between California and the, state and the, and the uh, federal government has created, in my view, a huge vacuum uh, of, of leadership on governance. That vacuum creates opportunities for the warriors uh, uh, to be on the march, and they certainly are on the march. Uh, the, 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 the weapon of choice lately are a mind-boggling series of lawsuits, which are like a, a circular firing squad uh, you know, in, in the cartoon here, um, the, uh, and from, from which I don't think anybody's gonna walk out alive. We need to figure out a way to get these lawyers to, to lower their pistols. Um, and then uh, all of this, of course, is supported by uh, combat science. Now, the two people shown there are definitely not combat science. They are two of the, uh, of the best, most objective scientists that think about the Delta. I put them up here to encourage you to read uh, a Cal Manor's commentary that they uh, jointly published, I think it was a week or two ago, uh, by, by Jeff Mount and Greg Gartrell. And if you want to understand a little bit about the combat science going on in the Delta, uh, read, that, read, that brief, uh, read that brief commentary. So, so I think that collaboration is, is pretty precarious in California, certainly at the statewide level. Uh, so what is the path forward? Um, what can we do uh, uh, about that problem with collaboration? Well, I've got a few suggestions for you. I hope you're getting ready to give, give me your suggestions. Uh, but first, let's support collaboration where it has a foothold to prove that it works. That's a picture of the Sacramento Valley. I can't tell you how encouraged I am at the way they're thinking up there about multiple benefits, water management, and even about, they're starting to think seriously about big picture governance. Uh, uh, water management and collaboration seem to be in the DNA of those folks. I would encourage you all to go on the Northern California Water Association's website, learn more about it, and then be, pre be prepared to visibly support what's going on in the Sacramento Valley. Second, 
urge the Newsom administration to lead us into a truly collaborative era uh, in, in water policy. I don't think we're going to be successful with this during the current political environment. Um, uh, but uh, and we certainly, at a minimum right now, should support Wade Crowfoot as he tries to get the voluntary agreements uh, back going, going again. Uh, we, and, and we need to set the stage for the third thing you can do, and that is use the November election as an opportunity to reset governance to collaboration in, in California. Um, uh, if Trump is elected, I'm not sure what the best strategy uh, is going to be on that. If Biden's elected uh, during the transition, I would encourage you guys to work with Northern Californians, environmentalists, and others to form as big of a, of a, of a coalition as you can that wants to support getting back to collaboration and then work the transition team for the new Biden administration, if that's what we have. Uh, work them like crazy. Um, uh, fourth, uh, we should be putting a spotlight on combat science. That's one of the things that's dividing us the most right now up in the Delta. Uh, and we've talked about some ideas at Stanford, and I briefed Charlie about them, and we'd certainly welcome your support and the things that we want to do at Stanford to try and put a spotlight on science to get rid of the combat, uh, combat science. Um, and then finally, I'm sure you all have some good ideas about how we move into the, uh, gov the collaborative era of California water. So let's talk. It's time for your questions and discussion. I ran a little bit long, but we still have time. That's all right, Tim. Thank you very much. And, and as you were describing that, uh, certainly understand uh, why there is value in signing up for classes that you'll be doing at some point at Stanford, because there, there's certainly more than an hour long discussion. Now, this just really, truly just touches the tip of the iceberg. But uh, I've got a couple of really good questions uh, that get down into some specific areas. But I want to start just for a moment, sort of on that macro level that you sort of ended on. It, it strikes me that in our current political environment, rather than pulling people towards the middle for an opportunity for collaboration, since government by its very design is meant to be conflict based, but you know, a, a scenario for people to actually compromise work solutions that are in the best interest of the whole. Of late, there's an argument to be made that we're really moving further to polarization within our, particularly the partisan political arena. Do you see that as being a, a, an opportunity or a, a still a problem to overcome? Because the cynic would say that it's the, the vitriol between political parties, it's not just a disagreement of philosophy or approach. It becomes almost like personal hatred. Isn't that harder to bring people together just to sit around a table? It is. Uh, and I don't think there's an easy path to dealing with it, but we need to find some way to make a lemonade out of these lemons that we've got today. This is not new, by the way. Uh, we had a lot of collaboration going on in California water in the 90s. Uh, I think it's fair to say that when uh, George W. Bush got elected, uh, the uh, agricultural interests thought that that was very much in their interest, and you know, why should they pay as much attention to collaboration? Same thing happened, I would argue, with Obama, uh, which the, uh, you know, the environmentalists in the Bay Area thought they had an upper hand. So if you've got an upper hand with the new administration, why sit down and bargain uh, with people who don't agree with you? Uh, the, uh, and and that, that's what's happening to a degree now with Trump, where, once again, agriculture thinks it's got an upper hand. The, but the simple fact is we all have to realize that upper hand ain't doing you any good in a governance system that can't produce. So the best way to deal with this, and that's one of the reasons I'm really pleased to be talking to such a large audience in Southern California, is to get lots of people interested in the collaborative model uh, and, to put, and to get some juice behind it so that when it, the administration changes, you've still got a chance of keeping your collaboration going. And we've done that to an extent uh, in recent decades, but we need to do it a lot more effectively than we have. Well, let me drill a little deeper with some specifics that, that uh, some of our audience have, have asked. So you, you listed a variety of examples of where you saw some success with the collaborative model. But the question is, you know, what have you learned regarding how to really successfully collaborate when there appears to be really not just no agreement, but there's no agreement on facts, there's no agreement on regulatory <laughs> structure, there's no agreement across the board and you do have people that have really kind of dug in and they've taken a position before they ever come to the table. What's kind of the one like golden nugget that you've pulled out of there to get that shift for people to uh, have that conversation? I, I have kind of two, two comments in that regard, Charlie. Uh, the first one is it's really important to develop those relationships at a personal level. All those pictures I showed on one of the early slides 
I spent a lot of time and energy on the road getting to know people and putting a human face on the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And that was pretty successful. And we built relationships. One of the things I mentioned in the, in the 40 Years paper is the three-way agreements. We need more of that kind of the three-way process. We need more of that kind of just people sitting down with each other and getting to know. That's why I put uh, Ann Hayden's picture up there. I'm hoping people will pick up their phones and say, Ann Hayden, I'd like to get to know you. And can you lead me to some other people in the environmental community? So we have to invest more in relationships than we have in the past. Uh, and the, the second thing, a little harsher comment, I don't like to think about collaboration this way, but collaboration comes down to divide and conquer. In all of the silos, in all of the silos, there are people who know collaboration is the best thing, and there are warriors who are never going to get that. So you have to do something that empowers the collaborationists in each of those silos, get them to part company with their warriors and be willing to get you know, some, some black and blue bruises on them, because you're going to get them, I know. Uh, uh, but but you, you've got to empower and engage uh, through relationship building, the people in each, of the, in each of the silos that are interested in actually getting something done. So I understand the trust-based relationships. Those don't just materialize overnight, um, particularly if I've already sort of got myself carved out. I, I certainly have experienced that when I have come to forums in Sac the Sacramento region. You know, usually they like to introduce you with those old adages and the old tags, like, okay, here's the guy from the South who's come to steal your water. <laughs> as a wonderful place to start. To start. Um, I, I have I have experienced that many times. So l let me ask you then, because there was you, again you had a, a whole number of, of examples. Uh, one of the questions here was then how do you characterize or would you characterize the the uh, IID San Diego County Water Authority agreement and related quantification settlement uh, and and their agreements back in in two thousand and three? Are those uh, other examples that you could list as collaborative or were those forced change? I, there's obviously some collaboration going on with, between IID and San Diego. Something that was unheard of a half a century ago became an important part of the QSA. So, you know, that's an example of, of, of something where you have both collaboration going on between the parties, but you also had a lot of warrior stuff going on between San Diego and the Metropolitan Water District. So, frankly, the world would have been a better place if we'd had collaboration on a broader scale there. But sometimes you have elements of both types of governance going on. So another question, I just want to stay on that thread for just a minute, because you also talked again in, that, in the warrior class. Folks kind of come to the table and they sort of get accustomed to a certain formula or culture because it, it starts to work for them. Whether they win or lose, it sort of works for them and they're sort of accustomed to it. Are there cultures uh, within your warrior model where it actually is their business model? It pays me to be confrontational. It pays me to take you to court it pays me to come up with alternative science. And I'll use, as you described, science and science facts that are to my benefit uh, because I, I know I can win with them as opposed to getting neutralized science facts. And, and that was kind of a two-part question, but is there a value in that? And how do you overcome those business models? And then can you, or how do you use science and experts over time to actually soften or change that? It's certainly is a, it certainly is a huge problem. Um, the, you know, the, the people with pre, preconceived notions about what, what should be happening out there. The, uh, but one of the things we're trying to do at Stanford, and I've talked to you about this, Charlie, is create in some public forums, put a spotlight on the science and show where the science agrees, where it disagrees, because a lot of people are telling a lot of stories about the science that simply aren't true. So just getting that shining on the light. And another one is, you know, the, I think it's, it's absolutely true that the, some people's business model is built around being a warrior. Uh, that's, I think there, that happens in all of the silos. To some people, uh, warriorism is, uh, is, is profitable to them. It, it protects them uh, in alignment where their hardliners are strong. But I want to strongly emphasize, you know, I, dare I name names, NRDC and the environmental uh, uh, in the environmental community. Their business model is bad people are doing bad things, give me money and I'll sue them. Uh, I don't know that an NRDC is ever going to break out of that, although I think we should keep trying. But I really want to emphasize strongly, that is not the, 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 mo the, the business model of everyone in the, in, in the environmental community. EDF has very much a collaborative business model. 
We should be making sure that gets rewarded. So does American River. So does the uh, the Sierra Conservancy. So does Cal Trout. So, so does Trout Unlimited. So does the Nature Conservancy. There are lots of environmental organizations out there that do not have that warrior model is my business model attitude. And, you, and, we, and it's what I said before. You need to find them. You need to create relationships. And you need to work with them. So I got to ask this because you, you mentioned it as well. Some, some of the collaborative business uh, models or some of the collaborative processes you talked about success were predicated off of some form of disaster. And so the question obviously is because of the way the Delta is currently so wired up, I'll use that term from, from your paper, are we really going to need an earthquake or some disaster, some major flooding where islands get wiped out and we just fundamentally, there are certain people that, have to now come back to the table because it's so broken? Charlie, my answer to that is I hope not. Uh, I think the circular firing squad of lawyers is, is, is a big enough crisis to stimulate an interest in, uh, in collaboration. You know, it was, it was legal disputes, uh, circular, uh, you know, circular uh, firing squad uh, of lawyers that, that stimulated co uh, collaboration in the Santa R Anna River Basin, in the San Gabriel River Basin. And many of the examples I put out there uh, are also were stimulated. I think we got plenty of crisis. Uh, we need to take advantage of it. Uh, I, a factor I should have mentioned earlier is a lot of times the, the leadership can come from the locals, but sometimes you need leadership coming from the administration. And again, I, I would like to get the governor of California to be our leader into the collaborative era. Right now, I think it's going to be very hard to have that happen. Uh, but we need to use the election, regardless of how it comes out, uh, as, as a turning point to, uh, to, to try and get Governor Gavin Newsom to realize if he wants to have a water policy, he needs to have a collaborative governance policy as well. So, so if you're taking something on the sort of the state larger, you know, since we're sort of talking about the Delta at this point, which is kind of that hub and it's the most critical and also the most controversial piece of California water conflict, uh, are there linkages then to local policy, the local policy process that then can help us drive that state or federal policy? Or is this really in that regard, you got to sort of start there and work your way down? And I'm thinking, I'm, sure. in, 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 I'm thinking in terms right now of, you know, I know, for instance, Metropolitan's going through their next iteration on integrated resource planning. The outcome of that is really may well be predicated on where is the state and the federal government in terms of the ability to move water statewide? Does one have to come before the other? How do those work? I'm not sure if I can answer this directly. Push me in the right direction, Charlie, if I don't get it right. But I think Metropolitan's IRP, I was very much involved in the first IRP of the Metropolitan Water District. Uh, and, and by the way, that's where we got into truly collaborative governance. It's when Met's customers were no longer just customers. The member agencies were no longer just customers. They were partners in regional water supply reliability. And I, I know that there are people who think that Met could be doing things slightly differently in their IRP, but the fact that they're out there doing it, use that as, as a lever to try and get the right kind of decision making up in the Delta. I wrote the, I wrote the policy in, in, uh, in the early 2000s that Met wasn't looking for more water, uh, Met is looking for reliable water. They want to know what they can count on in the future. I think you need to be beating that drum, which we did, uh, and, and, but, but, but by the time we got to the 2010s, quite frankly, you guys were shoulder to shoulder with Tom Birmingham and Westlands Water District, but we're saying this is all about getting more. We got to have more. Um, and I think Southern California needs to be loud and clear that that's not what's driving uh, uh, your water policy when it comes to the Delta. You need to, you, you, you need to know how much you can get when it's wet, how much you can get when it's dry. When it's wet, you want to combine that with your storage programs and your uh, conservation programs. And Southern California has been doing a marvelous job of that for the last 30 years. So let me go a little bit. We've got just a couple of minutes left. So I, I'm always interested, as you described, I mean, the very nature of the Southern California Water Coalition. I mean, there's a reason we changed the name from committee to coalition, yep. because they're, you know, to be collaborative, to be a co larger, larger tent, as you describe. Yes, it is often like a circus, and, and inviting people into that has, has been interesting, but also been fruitful for us. But I would, I would ask the question from your perspective, where do you think an organization like ours is best positioning itself to be an, uh, uh, an advantage or to be um, involved in that conversation on a serious level? I don't have a lot of suggestions for you, Charlie, as to how you do it better. I think the changes you've made in the last few years have been really good. Um, and so I'm, do more of what you do now. 
make sure that your coalition, that, that the coalition, Southern California Water Coalition grows as big as possible. I know you're working Washington, uh, you're working Sacramento, probably Washington, D.C. as well. Make sure that to the maximum extent possible, you are speaking with that clear, progressive voice that is the, the, the Southern California that I know I spent uh, over two decades with. Well, I appreciate that. And just as we're coming up on our, our 1115, so I do need to sort of bring it to a close. I want to say thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for doing this today. I thank think you. It was, as we expected, very instructive. And for those that did join us today, this entire concept of bringing to you a webinar, this is our way to be transformative uh, and be able to utilize the uh, the pandemic, as, as disruptive as that has been, we have been creative in creating this series. And based upon the reaction we have received from our surveys and the audiences that have participated, you have found this to be of value and something then we'll look to add to our portfolio of services that we offer to our membership. So thank you to our audience as well. I will ask again, because we drive our decisions based upon your survey, the surveys we give you and the reaction that you give us. So please take the survey that is available for you today uh, and let us know what you thought worked in this, in this uh, setting, what didn't work so we can make improvements. Uh, we are looking very hard at how we make this a permanent part of our portfolio going forward so we can reach a larger number of audiences and, and bring guests like Tim, who's in Northern California, and not have to travel. You know, we're, we're always really good about saying we are centrally located and convenient to no one. This format's made us convenient to virtually anybody that can take an hour out of their very busy day. So I want to say thank you again to all of you for participating with us. I want to say thank you again to our sponsors, Cayegas, and to our, our principal sponsors that help this organization run. Uh, look forward to your feedback, and we look forward to our next program. Uh, but for now, we say thank you. Go out and make this community a better place to live, work, and play, because that's what we're here for. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Charlie.